Hi everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on African American Identity in Popular Culture, Part 1, 1600s to 1800s. Uh, this, is part of, this is part one of a three-part mini lecture series that is uh, looking at African American identity in popular culture, and all of these videos are part of a larger uh, run of videos on popular culture of the U.S., a course taught by Lance Eaton at North Shore Community College. So within this mini lecture, we're going to really try to understand how African American identity has been represented, misrepresented, abused within popular culture, uh, and how that came to be. And it's an important piece because our perception today, even today in 2015, uh, is skewed. And it's skewed from misinformation, and it's skewed from not really understanding how this has, what has happened. Uh, to African American African Americans historically, culturally, and beyond. So in order to wrap our heads around this, we have to understand a couple things that have occurred. Uh, when we look at African Americans, we have to understand that there was four, over 400 years of cultural dehumanization. That is, as a culture, continually trying to dehumanize them, devalue them. We also have to deal with the fact that science, and I'll, you know, we put, put scientific there in, in quotations, spent hundreds of years dehumanizing African Americans, that is, the, or Africans in general. That is, the, the, the long history of science, particularly in the 1800s and early 1900s, continued to say Africans are less than Caucasians. Uh, and there's a variety of different fields, and again, I put these in quotation fields of science that did this, like eugenics. Ultimately, this reminds us that there can be a certain amount of bias within science, and in this case, it was self-serving to typically Caucasian or people of European descent. And then we also have to deal with the fact that this country has almost over 300 years of legal dehumanization of African Americans. That's over 300 years where the system said, yes, all people are created equal, but African Americans are, are less equal. And we'll take a look at that. And that has, you know, we have to understand that happened all the way up through the 1900s. Segregation, uh, making it illegal for African Americans to marry people of different races. These things were happening still in the 1900s. So we are not so far away from a culture. In fact, all of these things end around, or we see them start to end around the 1900s. All of these things, you know, deeply influence and have a lasting legacy. You don't go from hundreds of years of believing a group less than human to turning that off. It takes time. And so we still have that influence hovering over us and still present in certain veins of popular culture. So let's take a look at what's going on in the popular culture and what's going on in the law as a good example. So 1787, we have the U.S. Constitution, which is a powerful, wonderful document, except that it also has the Three-Fifths Compromise. And the Three-Fifths Compromise acknowledges slavery, says it's okay, and says, in fact, well, slaves count as three-fifths of a person, mostly just so the Caucasian landowners can have more, representa more representation in Congress. It doesn't mean more representation for the slaves. It means more representation for the slave owners. The 1820 Missouri Compromise uh, uh, basically said that, well, as, as the United States further explores or further creates territories and states in the western area after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, states above a certain parallel will be slave-free states, and states below a certain parallel will be slave states. So it was a document that just further reinforced the idea of slavery in a slave society. We see in 1830s the rise of blackface minstrelsy, and blackface minstrelsy was was typically when uh, Caucasian people would go out and paint their faces black and perform in front of audiences and they would perform as black people or as that they perceived black people and it was often hyperbolically ridiculous and s extremely stereotyping um, of all sorts but what we have to remember is many people in the country at this time may never have directly encountered 
an African American face to face or had a conversation. So people all over the country as these traveling shows went around, this became one of their major examples of what it means to be African American. In that certainly whole or you know, that certainly challenged uh, empathy that challenged the opportunity or, or certainly didn't help the cause for ending slavery because if you per, you know if your only examples are what are buffoons and idiots and that's often how these what you would see in blackface minstrelsy it created a lot of problems 1845 we see start to see the rise of slave narratives and one of the most famous is of course Frederick Douglass uh, who accounts of his tale, and it's a powerful tale, and people read it, but it's not nearly as powerful as Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and I always find that fascinating that the true story, by, you know, in autobiography of a former slave doesn't prove as moving as a white woman who writes a fictional tale about a slave or a family of slaves there's an interesting contrast there there's something to be aware of and to to think about uh meanwhile in between these two pieces the fugitive slave act had uh emerged and that too was also a problematic um problematic law allowing for of course the retrieval of slaves up into the north and of it it created cer certain problems because of course um how do african americans prove they're not a slave um it's very easy to prove you're a slave, not as easy to prove you're not a slave, like making sure you have papers. And, you know, it creates a real challenge for African Americans that are free and leaves them extremely vulnerable. And that's important because as we get to the 1857 Dred Scott decision, it largely, um, the decision boiled down to that, you know, African Americans do not have the same legal rights, even when they are free as Caucasians. Uh, they, are, it, they are unable to do things like sue in federal court. Um, it was a very, very, you know, problematic law that said, well, even if you're free from slavery, you're still not an equal citizen. And then, of course, by 1863, we get the Emancipation Proclamation. The Civil War is in full swing, and Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a powerful, important document, but even freeing the slaves, even at the end of the Civil War, it's not as easy as everything's done because now you have people living next to each other who used to own each other, or you know, one who used to own the other. And the question, of course, there is, well, how do you how do you rectify that? How do you deal with your neighbor who used to whip you and is now somehow not your owner anymore? And then by 1864, we get the passing of the 13th Amendment. And this re, you know, this reinforced again the idea that you, you know, you could not own a slave, uh, that you could not own people, which wonderful, absolutely powerful, uh, but that doesn't necessarily end the challenge of race. And I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions people have about understanding African Americans, African American, African American history is that it does not end with the Civil War. We'll still see a whole lot more problems coming up that are both legal and cultural. So in 1865, the end of the Civil War, um, you know, that is a that is a big step forward now with all these things gone on. And 1868 gives us the uh, 14th Amendment, which is a powerful amendment saying equal protection under the law. The problem is while that law is there, there's still a lot of, our, you know, we do not see equal protection under the law. And there's some that would argue even today we do not see equal protection under the law when you compare, you know, the, the rates of convictions when you compare, you know, between different populations. And then in 1870, the passing of the 15th Amendment, and this eliminated race and color as qualifications for voting. So we do see there's some really great laws being passed that try to undermine or undo the harm. Um, but it's going to be extremely hard culturally because there's going to still be a push back against this. And by 1877, you have the end of Reconstruction. Now, for those that don't know, Reconstruction um, occurred at the end of the Civil at the end of the Civil War. You know, the South is ravaged and has been 
in a state of disarray. And so there's a variety of, of people, both as part of the government and not, that go down to help to reconstruct and rebuild the South and also to secure the safety of African Americans. And so when Reconstruction ends and all so many of those forces move out, it does create a vacuum. Um, and we do see a strong backlash against African Americans that occur uh, during this time. And that comes in the form particularly of the rise of Jim Crow laws. Uh, and these were laws that typically were there as a means of preventing African Americans from partaking in everyday in, in everyday society. Uh, they could be things like sundown laws which basically would say uh, if you're an African American who is in town past sundown you're going to be arrested if not worse because you shouldn't be there. Um, there are a lot of restrictive laws about where African Americans can go and what they can do. So shortly after this we see some really interesting examples within popular culture have some discussions about this. The first is the most one of the most famous uh, Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn uh, and it is this fascinating discussion about race and you know how is it that a 13 14 year old boy can kind of go through the self un unbothered almost whereas the adult African-American who happens to be a runaway slave is constantly beleaguered. Um, there's a really interesting discussion about race and, and you could also say privilege within this story. Uh, Twain comes back to this discussion of race actually about 10 years later in The Tragedy of Puddinhead Wilson. It's a much shorter book uh, than Huckleberry Finn and it is, it is a very different book. Uh, but it's equally fascinating because he has within the story a basically a switching of birth between a African-American child and a Caucasian child and you know the question of nature versus nurture is front and center in this discussion um, and kind of how these two characters succeed or don't succeed. Uh, so we see that. We do start to see the rise of, of texts that have this discussion. We do see that race is definitely still part of and um, valid discussion fodder for popular culture and we'll see in the next in part two um, you know we have some really good examples here but we start to see increasingly challenging or questionable examples um, especially as we get into the 1890s uh, we see the rise of lynching in general in lynching souvenirs and the third video in this series will will show some examples of lynch, lynching souvenirs which are very heart-wrenching to see. Uh, these were often when people would lynch an African-American for trespassing some social or cultural uh, expectation and the person would be lynched and people would take their pictures with the lynched body. Typically lynching entails hanging and then somehow brutalizing the body. It can be burning, it can be beating, um, it's a variety, it's just a very brutal thing and people actually lining up to take pictures with a lynched body and what does that say about our culture or the culture of the time all right that's all for now thank you very much for watching